In a new essay this week, Minneapolis Fed President Neil Kashkari says that he thinks the Fed has time to monitor upcoming economic data before starting to cut rates. He said there's less risk that the too tight monetary policy will derail this economic recovery. Neil actually joins us right now. And uh, Neil, thank you for being here today. There have been a lot of questions in the market after uh, Jay Powell went on, the, the chairman of the Fed went on 60 Minutes over the weekend and talked a little bit about how those rate cuts basically don't expect them in March. That's been your message as well. What are you seeing right now? Well, we keep getting surprised in a good way that the economy is showing up to be remarkably resilient. Consumer spending is staying strong. The labor market is staying strong, as evidenced by the really strong jobs report on Friday. That's all really good news. And that tells me maybe monetary policy is not putting as much downward pressure on demand as we would otherwise think. And so, given that, I think we can take more time, get the inflation data, see it continuing, hopefully, to come in uh, very attractively around our 2 percent target. It gives us more time to assess that data before we start reducing interest rates. And so I think this is a, a good problem to have, but we're trying to figure out some of these mixed economic signals. What would it take for you to think that rate cuts would be acceptable come May? What kind of data would you need to see leading up to that? Well, I think it's similar to what the chairman said on his 60 Minutes interview, which is we're not looking for better uh, inflation data. We're just looking for additional inflation data that is also at around this 2 percent level. The, on a six-month basis and three-month basis, inflation is already back roughly to our 2 percent target. If we get to see a few more months of that data, I think that'll give us a lot of confidence that we are well on our way back to 2 percent. And then, of course, the other side of our dual mandate is equally important, the labor market. Yeah. Hopefully, we will continue to see a very strong labor market. That I think would give me confidence that now is the time to start dialing it back slowly. You need a strong labor market to suggest that it's time to dial back slowly? I mean, that's almost counterintuitive. Because well, Chairman Powell it, the, made those comments. They were taped before the jobs report on Friday. That was a really strong number. It was a really strong number. I think the, you know, there's been a lot of debate over the last few days on the speed with which we would then cut. Uh, if the labor market continues to be quite strong, that would give me confidence to say, well, we can dial things back quite slowly from here. If we saw a material slowdown in the labor market, then that would say, hey, maybe we need to start cutting rates a little bit more quickly. And so that's, that's why it's the, the speed of the reductions that the labor market, I think, is going to have a big influence over. So how many rate cuts are you factoring in for this year right now, given this latest information? I mean, if, if, if the Fed dots plots were suggesting six rate cuts, what, what, what do you think is more likely? I mean, uh, you know, I think the, we're going to put out a new dot plot in March. Uh, you know, we'll see where I'm ultimately at, given the data that we get between now and then. Sitting here today, I would say two to three cuts would seem to be appropriate for me right now. But again, I don't want to prejudge things, but that's, a, that's my gut based on the data we have so far. Okay, that's a very different picture than, than what the market had been anticipating. This week, we did see the 30-year mortgage rise above 7 percent again for the first time since December. And, and that's a pretty significant number for homeowners. Does that concern you at all? Well, that's a great example, Becky. When we went from, you know, 30-year mortgage rate at 3 percent all the way to 8 percent, I would have thought that that would have slammed the brakes on the housing market. As I put in my essay that we published on Monday, Remarkably, construction employment has continued to grow over, over that time. Uh, investment in residential, uh, residential investment has been roughly flat. So there has been remarkable resilience in the housing market, whether it's single family or bleeding over to multifamily. That's been surprising to me. I would have thought that 7 or 8 percent mortgage rates would have been uh, a bigger constraint on demand. That's also what makes me question how tight is monetary policy relative to what we consider the neutral rate in this reopening economy. The commercial real estate entire industry will tell you that they are in big trouble, at least anybody who's an owner of any of these uh, loans that need to get repriced. Anybody who's out there, maybe potentially on the sidelines, thinking they can step in and get a better bargain, wouldn't go along with that. But how much does that weigh on you, the idea that there are a lot of commercial real estate loans that, if they don't get refinanced, are, are going to be problems, and then there are banks that hold some of those commercial real estate loans, uh, New York Community Bank Corp, um, the pressure that we've seen it under over the last week. 
Well, we're paying attention very closely to it. I do want to make one adjustment to what you said. It's not commercial real estate across the board. It really is focused on the office sector. Many other segments within commercial real estate seem to be doing very well. Uh, and so that I think that that delineation is important. And we are we think it's going to be on a bank by bank basis where we see pressures flare up and our bank supervisors are in very close contact with other supervisors around the country and of course with bank management to monitor their portfolio. So it's something we're watching very carefully, but I do think most of commercial real estate is doing well. Uh, it really is just the office segment. So that is not enough for the Fed to really be concerned though. I, I, I guess the expectation is you don't think that this is a big problem that spreads through a lot of the banks? Uh, as of right now, again, it's, you know, you never want to say never. As of right now, it does seem to be more idiosyncratic to individual banks with individual exposures rather than systemic. But again, we're monitoring it very, very carefully. You know, the other issue that people will point to is the amount of, of debt that we have as a nation and the idea of trying to sell treasuries at 5.3 percent versus 3 percent. I mean, that's a big deal, too. Does that ever come into the conversations or the thoughts at the Fed, just what happens with what we're going to have to do? Uh, not for the Fed. You know, the, the ultimately, the amount of Treasuries that get issued, the amount of taxes and spending, that's up to the Congress and the U.S. Treasury Department. Our jobs are to just take those inputs and try to model what they mean and ultimately achieve our dual mandate goals. So that really, for us, is that really is the distinction between fiscal and monetary policy. He, Neil, if is, is growth, economic growth, by definition, do we know for sure that it's inflationary? And, and where I'm going with this uh, is that you could make the case that uh, if it's not inflationary, there's no reason to try to ever curb economic growth. You, you ought to let the good times roll. In other words, there'd be a reason, I guess, to bring rates down because you 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 know it, it, that's expensive too that's inflationary it's hard for business development so it'd be nice to keep rates as low as you could but on the other hand do you need it, do you need dry powder for the next time there is an actual slowdown to cut what is a more important force uh, for, for central bankers well, I think the core of what you just said, Joe, the scenario you just gave is really about productivity growth. If we do see a big boost in productivity because of AI, for example, then you would expect a higher growth rate, which is non-inflationary. And that would be really positive. And then you would expect then the neutral interest rate would likely be higher in that environment. <clears throat> and then we would adjust policy to not try to tamp down growth, but just to respond to the economic environment. So in that situation, you'd see strong growth, not a lot of inflation, and monetary policy would be supportive of that. Mm -hmm. And so I hope that's what we all, in the end, I hope that's what we end up seeing.